Yes, Fred, but who do we kill now? The Deadly Mission of Phineas Snodgrass by Frederick Pohl This is the story of Phineas Snodgrass, inventor. He built a time machine. He built a time machine, and in it he went back some 2,000 years to about the time of the birth of Christ. He made himself known to the Emperor Augustus, his lady Livia, and other rich and powerful Romans of the day, and, quickly making friends, secured their cooperation in bringing about a rapid transformation of year one living habits. He stole the idea from a science fiction novel by L. Sprague de Camp called Lest Darkness Fall. His time machine wasn't very big, but his heart was, so Snodgrass selected his cargo with the plan of providing the maximum immediate help for the world's people. The principal features of ancient Rome were dirt and disease, pain and death. Snodgrass decided to make the Roman world healthy and to keep its people alive through 20th century medicine. Everything else could take care of itself once the human race was free of its terrible plagues and early deaths. Snodgrass introduced penicillin and oreomycin and painless dentistry. He ground lenses for spectacles and explained the surgical techniques for removing cataracts. He taught anesthesia and the germ theory of disease and showed how to purify drinking water. He built Kleenex factories and taught the Romans to cover their mouths when they coughed. He demanded and got covers for the open Roman sewers, and he pioneered the practice of the balanced diet. Snodgrass brought health to the ancient world, and he kept his own health too. He lived to more than a hundred years. He died, in fact, in the year A.D. 100, a very contented man. When Snodgrass arrived in Augustus' great palace on the Palatine Hill, there were some 250 million human beings alive in the world. He persuaded the Principate to share his blessings with all the world, benefiting not only the 100 million subjects of the Empire, but the other 100 millions in Asia and the tens of millions in Africa, the Western Hemisphere, and all the Pacific Islands. Everybody got healthy. Infant mortality dropped at once, from 90 deaths in 100 to fewer than two. Life expectancies doubled immediately. Everyone was well and demonstrated their health by having more children who grew in health to maturity and had more. It is a feeble population that cannot double itself every generation if it tries. These Romans, Goths, and Mongols were tough. Every 30 years, the population of the world increased by a factor of two. In the year AD 30, the world population was a half billion. In AD 60, it was a full billion. By the time Snodgrass passed away, a happy man, it was as large as it is today. It is too bad that Snodgrass did not have room in his time machine for the blueprints of cargo ships, the texts on metallurgy to build the tools that would make the reapers that would harvest the fields for the triple expansion steam turbines that would generate the electricity that would power the machines that would run the cities, for all the technology that 2,000 subsequent years had brought about. But he didn't. Consequently, by the time of his death, conditions were no longer quite perfect. A great many were badly housed. On the whole, Snodgrass was pleased, for all these things could surely take care of themselves. With a healthy world population, the increase of numbers would be a mere spur to research. Boundless nature, once its ways were studied, would surely provide for any number of human beings. Indeed it did. Steam engines on the new common design were lifting water to irrigate fields to grow food long before his death. The Nile was dammed at Aswan in the year 55. Battery-powered streetcars replaced ox carts in Rome and Alexandria before A.D. 75, and the galley slaves were freed by huge, clumsy diesel outboards that drove the food ships across the Mediterranean a few years later. In the year A.D. 200, the world had now something over 20 billion souls, and technology was running neck and neck with expansion. Nuclear-driven plows had cleared the Teutoburgwald, 
where viruses' bones were still moldering, and fertilizer made from ion exchange mining of the sea produced fantastic crops of hybrid grains. In AD 300, the world population stood at a quarter of a trillion. Hydrogen fusion produced fabulous quantities of energy from the sea. Atomic transmutation converted any matter into food. This was necessary because there was no longer any room for farms. The earth was getting crowded. By the middle of the 6th century, the 60 million square miles of land surface on the earth were so well covered that no human being standing anywhere on dry land could stretch out his arms in any direction without touching another human being standing beside him. But everyone was healthy, and science marched on. The seas were drained, which immediately tripled the available land area. In 50 years, the sea bottoms were also full. Energy, which had come from the fusion of marine hydrogen, now came by the tapping of the full energy output of the sun through gigantic mirrors composed of pure force. The other planets froze, of course, but this no longer mattered, since in the decades that followed they were disintegrated for the sake of the energy at their cores. So was the Sun. Maintaining life on Earth on such artificial standards was prodigal of energy consumption. In time, every star in the galaxy was transmitting its total power output to the Earth, and plans were afoot to tap Andromeda, which would care for all necessary expansion for... 30 years. At this point, a calculation was made. Taking the weight of the average man at about 130 pounds, in round numbers 6 times 10 to the 4 grams, and allowing for a continuing doubling of population every 30 years, although there was no such thing as a year anymore since the sun had been disintegrated, now a lonely earth floated aimlessly towards Vega. It was discovered that by the year 1970, the total mass of human flesh, bone, and blood would be 6 times 10 to the 27 grams. This presented a problem. The total mass of the Earth itself was only 5.98 times 10 to the 27 grams. Already, humanity lived in burrows, penetrating crust and basalt, and quarrying into the congealed nickel-iron core. By 1970, all the core itself would have been transmuted into living men and women, and their galleries would have to be tunneled through masses of their own bodies, a writhing, squeezed ball of living corpses drifting through space. Moreover, simple arithmetic showed that this was not the end. In finite time, the mass of human beings would equal the total mass of the galaxy, and in some further time, it would equal and exceed the total mass of all galaxies everywhere. This state of affairs could no longer be tolerated, and so a project was launched. With some difficulty, resources were diverted to permit the construction of a small but important device. It was a time machine. With one volunteer aboard, selected from the 900 trillion who applied, it went back to the year one. Its cargo was only a hunting rifle with one cartridge, and with that cartridge, the volunteer assassinated Snodgrass as he trudged up the Palatine. To the great, if only potential, joy of some quintillions of never-to-be-born persons, darkness blessedly fell. <laughs>